I'm to blame for JavaScript. <laughs> it's, it's a little embarrassing because it was a rush job. It was supposed to be a sidekick language to Sun's Java language. But times have changed, and Java is nowhere, and JavaScript had enough good in it that the sidekick became the superhero. Robin is now Batman. JavaScript is perhaps the most widely used programming language in the world, and it's getting better. So JavaScript's doing OK. It's my 21-year-old that I'm kicking out of the house. <laughs> but there's a problem on the web. JavaScript plays a part in it, and I must speak about it. And that problem is a long story. So I'm going to go out there first by going back to 1992, three years before JavaScript. The web was very small then. It was like this little nebula. It had only text files in it. It was free of, of cat pictures and videos and dancing babies. <laughs> it didn't even have proper e-commerce or security. But the web is always evolving. And in 1993, Mark Andreessen, in the Mosaic browser, added support for the image element. Why not? You want to put your cat pictures on your page. You put up your image. You put a little sort of reference to it in the page. And there it is, right in your, your web page. In 1994, Lou Montulli at Netscape created the cookie. What is a cookie? It's a delicious snack. It's also, something that whenever I go to Europe really bothers me because I see these blue bars at the top of news sites, and I have to say, yes, okay, you're using cookies. But what a cookie is, it's a little tricky. It's a piece of memory on your computer that a website can control. It can put data into it, and then when you go away, that data stays on your computer, even if you shut your computer down. When you come back to that website, Whatever was put in that cookie got sent back to that website. It was intended to be used for things like remembering you so you wouldn't have to log in and type your password every time you went back to a site, even just back and forward in your browser. And that was a good purpose for it. So cookies were a good thing, at least for that. In 1995, I had a JavaScript, and that made things even more powerful. You could set cookies from JavaScript. You could do things that weren't possible before JavaScript came along with cookies and images. What happened was not intended. It was a side effect, not a strategy. But between images that you could load from anywhere, including your friend's website, and cookies that, with anything you load, could store a little bit of data on your computer, and JavaScript targeted ads and tracking, invasive tracking, were invented. You think about tracking, nobody knows really how it works. It has something to do with cookies. Think about trackers as cat images. It'll make lots more sense. Cat images can drop cookies on your computer. You can put a cat image from your friend's website. Why not? This is called hot linking. I think that came about as a term because if your friend's cat was really cute and 10,000 pages linked to it and they all requested that image at once, your friend's server would get very hot, would, fan would turn on. But what if that isn't your friend? What if that's a tracker? It turns out people do relate to sites they go to. I go to a news site or an e-commerce site. I go to my bank. I, I really want to know it's my bank. I want to log into it. And it may use a cookie to remember me. So far, so good. But if I go to a news site and it has an image, that's actually tracking me, and I can't see it, then I'm not so happy. The trackers don't use cat pictures, unfortunately. They originally used little tiny images, just one pixel. And these are called pixels even to this day. With JavaScript, you don't even need an image. You just use a script. And it can store a cookie for its server that remembers you, even though you don't know anything about that, that server. You don't have any relationship with that tracker. And look what this has wrought. We have a, a horrendous problem with ad clutter. It's not just annoying. It's not just slow. 
it's kind of creepy how it, it tracks you around the web and promotes things to you. Not always the right thing. And we've all seen how when you go on holiday and you've just bought things, the day you come back, you're being promoted to buy those same things again. You don't need them. But it also drains your battery, especially your mobile phone battery, because all that JavaScript, all those images, takes up a lot of time to load. It runs the radio, it drains the battery. And worst of all, it creates an opportunity for malicious software called malware to be disguised as legitimate advertising, hence the term malvertising. And this is a real problem. In the spring of this year, malvertising got onto some top publishers, including the BBC Online, New York Times, and other sites. And was not intended, again, by those publishers that they would ever have malicious software on their sites. Let's dig a little deeper into how this happened. This is a proof point diagram of an actual malvertising system. The blue is part of the regular ad tech system that all publishers use, along with cookies and scripts and images, to try to get the right ad to you. The red part is fake ad agencies. It's unbelievable. It's outrageous. They, they make fake people with fake biographies and fake LinkedIn accounts. And these fake ad agencies buy cheap ad space. And they sometimes manage to put one of their malicious ads into it. And the ad looks like an ad. And you can't judge a book by its cover any more than you can judge an ad by its surface characteristics. In this case, they actually hide the malicious code very cleverly inside the image. And it passes muster. It looks like an ad. And it gets placed into a publisher site. This diagram also shows some problems. If you look closely, even in the blue, there's just too much going on. There are what are called ad exchanges. These evolved over the last eight or nine years to help find, in real time, the best ad for you based on the tracker's dossier that they've compiled for you based on these cookies and pixels. So trackers build up little dossiers on you. The publisher sends through a script a message off to the exchange saying, find me the best ad for this user. And sometimes that ad turns into malware. But even if it's not actually malicious advertising, there's a fee taken from the ad exchange and from other parties involved in this very complex system. So it turns out a lot of the players have an incentive to permit fraudulent ads through their system. Not just malicious ones, but just fake ones that try to cause more, more money to be spent. And it is indeed spent. The estimates for how much is wasted vary from the billions to the tens of billions. You would hope that you would have some protection with your browser. We all have a browser, or we use a mobile browser, or we use an app with a web view in it. These should protect you. They're your agent. They're your interface to the web. Unfortunately, the top browsers, most of them anyway, have a conflict of interest. They are either directly or indirectly dependent on advertising. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to kill their own golden goose. And they have a hard time deciding what's a bad ad. That's because, and this is my fault in part, we didn't make it clear back in the 90s that this image is an ad, and that image is actually part of the site you're going to. It's something to do with your bank or your e-commerce site. We didn't distinguish those cases. So it's, it's hard to say what's good and what's bad, but it can be done. And people do run ad blockers. They do seek out protection. It's just hard to use, and sometimes it breaks. I think we need a new generation of browsers that can pioneer new web standards that are defensive by default, that protect you from the so-called third parties, these sites you've never been to that track you and that may give you an ad you didn't want, may give you an ad that's malware. I think that can be done, and it is being done, by a new generation of products. If enough people adopt this, if we all join together and pick these new browsers and new tools to protect ourselves, then with enough scale, we can change the web. We can not only change it by protecting ourselves, we can improve things for our beloved websites. 
because the websites aren't making enough money from advertising. Remember in the blue box, there were too many parties taking a cut of the revenue that comes from the marketing side. And that means there's less and less every year for the publishers. If we replumb the system and cut out the middle players, there will be more for the publishers. And there should be some for you. If you want safer ads, if you, rather than paying the publisher, would rather take some ads that are good and safe and private to you, you should get a cut. Your attention costs something. Right now, it's priced at zero, and you get annoyances, you get risk, so sometimes you get malware, and there's nothing you can do about it. There's no liability today attaching because of that deep system of interconnected parties. No one is taking responsibility for the malvertising risk. So, I want to encourage everyone here, first of all, to protect yourselves by using ad blocking and tracking protection. There are many solutions to choose from. See what's best for you and use it. Second, support your favorite websites. There are also several new tools and browsers you can use that allow you to pay the websites you like, sometimes with very high privacy and even anonymity. So, Please help those sites that you like make up for the lost ad revenue from your blocking the dangerous ads. Finally, try to imagine a world where you own your dossier. It's your online life. It should be your data. If you own it, then you can give terms of service to the big network superpowers, the walled gardens, the giant companies that own too much of your data right now, as well as them giving you their terms of service, which no one ever reads. That would be a good day. I've been doing this for a long time, and one thing I've learned over 21 years, if enough people choose new innovative browsers, they can have more fun, they can be safer, they can get a fairer share, and they can create a new web. Let's do it. Thank you.